is our Greek professor. He's got a background. He went to, where did Dan Ingram go? He went to Cedarville College back then, now it's Cedarville University. And he also got his master's at Calvary uh, Theological Seminary and his PhD at Baptist Bible Seminary. And he's currently adjunct pr professor for us. So Mark is going to come up and give us a, uh, an understanding of his, what he's seeing and the significance that he sees for Chafer Seminary. Okay, so Mark. Thank you, Robbie. You know, as Robbie said, I am Mark Mills, and what I would like to do is to share with you how and why I came to be at Chafer Seminary. And in order to do that, I would like to read a passage of Scripture. This is 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through, <clears throat> through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul warns Timothy here that evil people and imposters will abound. And they will only grow worse in their deception and their tactics. People will turn away from the truth, and they won't want to listen to biblical doctrine. But they will readily accept man-made theories, ideologies, stories, and ideas that give them what they want to hear. It sounds hopeless, but Paul gives the solution. The solution is men of God like Timothy who know and believe the Holy Scriptures. It is God's Word that is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness, so that pastors like Timothy will be fully prepared to accomplish every good thing that God desires. But Timothy must do two things in order to stand against evil and defection from the truth. He must continue in the faith. He knows the truth. He, he has the faith, but he must continue in it. And he must preach the word of God. I believe that the best way for pastors to stand in a pulpit and to preach the word of God with confidence, knowing that they have an understanding of the original message of the audience, to, of the author to his audience, is to understand the original languages. In 2005, my wife Gail and I agreed that I would pursue a seminary degree so that I could teach New Testament Greek to men training for ministry. That's why I'm glad to be here at Chafer Seminary. Chafer's level of commitment to rigorous training in Greek and Hebrew is not common. If a seminary even does require the original languages, they've abandoned things like grammatical diagramming, thinking it's a waste of time. Chafer Seminary disagrees, and so do I. But just knowing the languages, that's one component. A pastor has to be able to understand the text so that he can draw the original meaning from the text, that intended by the original author. <clears throat> 
That's also why I'm glad to be here at Chafer Seminary. Chafer is committed to the authority of the scriptures. That is where God's authority resides for us today. And so it's imperative to train men how to do exegesis, that is, drawing the meaning out of the text. It's the only way that a pastor can stand in the pulpit and preach God's word and not his own words. And this is foundational to all the other disciplines. If we can understand God's message as he intended it in his word. Now, how I came to be at Chafer Seminary is truly an act of God. You know, as Dr. Johnson has been emphasizing family histories, 2 Timothy is about the family history of ministers of the gospel, ministers of the word of God. Now, I had no idea what God would do with my training once I finished my studies, but he had a plan. He brought two men to Baptist Bible seminaries and put them in separate courses of study. But then he crossed their paths in one course. When I met David Roseland, I knew nothing about Chafer Seminary. I didn't know it existed. But he explained to me the philosophy, the vision for Chafer Seminary, and the Lord took it from there. Uh, two years ago in uh, spring of 2020, I taught my first course here at Chafer Seminary. And I count it a privilege to be involved in preparing men for standing in the pulpit, handling the word of God as it ought to be handled. Now, if any of you are thinking about preparing for ministry like this, or you know someone who's preparing for ministry, consider Chafer Seminary. You know, there are easier ways to get a degree and put on your resume. Uh, Chafer is rigorous. However, to prepare for handling the word of God, to be able to reflect academic excellence and faithfulness to the scriptures, that's not a very easy combination to find. So I pray that as I have a role in this preparing of men for ministry, that these men will be able to go out to strengthen churches to stand against deceptive and evil men and ideologies so that our churches will be strong and that they can continue the family history of ministers of the gospel who take the truth of God to the next generation. Thank you. That's exactly what we need at uh, Chafer is the, this kind of quality. And what we had when we were discussing this uh, uh, in the founding years with George and others is that men would be able to go out from Chafer after they graduated competent enough with their original languages. We're going to be singing first, but you need to get wired up. Competent enough in the original languages that their uh, Hebrew Bible... Back then, we had the BHS, which was really big, and it ended up as a doorstop um, for a lot of people. And they barely could do a word study in Greek. Uh, a lot of men got, used to, you know, just went from three years of Greek and two years of Hebrew, and that's hardly enough to get really competent. So we're really glad to have Mark on board. Okay. Let's uh, let's take our Bibles if we could and open them to the book of First Californians. Excuse me, First Corinthians. First uh, Corinthians, chapter thirteen, and verse eight. And this, uh, I realize, this is the Lazarus session right after lunch, and so it's a tough topic to get into when your stomach is filled with food, and you're kind of nodding off, but I asked for uh, Dr. Dean to give me something non-controversial to talk about, <laughs> so he assigned me the meaning of the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. <clears throat> 
And look at that. I don't even have the right PowerPoint up yet. So let me see what I can do here. No, I have not. <laughs> Just asked my wife about that. <laughs> yeah, let's see here. There it is. Meaning of the perfect. No, that's the Dropbox one. Let's see. Let's see if this one works. There we go. Can you guys see that? All right. Praise the Lord. And uh, there we go. Um, does that look a little tiny to you? Okay, as long as you can see it, we're good, okay? Yeah. Um, well, unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, you probably know there's a big brouhaha in the body of Christ. And the brouhaha deals with let me try something else here. No, wouldn't you know it? I can't find the uh, exact PowerPoint I'm looking for. So I'll have to, I'll have to go with this little tiny one. Um, the big brouhaha deals with the disputed gifts. So there are certain gifts of the Holy Spirit that are disputed. Um, the gift of apostle. We have people today that claim to be apostles, and I usually ask them, man, you look good for your age if you're an apostle. <laughs> uh, prophet, worker of miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing and knowledge. And as you know, um, Christianity, Christendom is divided into two, really, on these gifts, these seven disputed ones. You have continuationists or charismatics who believe all of them are for today. And then you have another group that I like to call selective cessationists. I much prefer that title than cessationist uh, because we do believe in some gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. Amen. In fact, I, a, whole, a church flew me out. Um, to teach for them, and I discovered that they don't believe any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today at all. And I said, well, you could have saved yourself a lot of money flying me out, because I think I have the gift of teaching. <laughs> but there's another group, which, which is where we are, Chafer Seminary, that most of the gifts are available today, but some selectively passed away. And a major battle in this, or major text, I should say, in this battle is 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10. Verse 8 mentions prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. And then verse 10 says, but when the perfect comes, the partial, that would be prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, will be done away with. So the big battle here is what is meant by the perfect. If the perfect is talking about something yet future, then prophecy, tongues, and knowledge should be in continuation. If the perfect is talking about something that happened in the past, then prophecy, tongues, and knowledge ceased as well. Um, so before we get started, let me just lay a couple of um, things down by way of a foundation. When it talks about prophecy, knowledge, and tongues, I'm understanding those three gifts as revelatory gifts. In other words, these were actually tools that God was using in the first century as direct conduits of divine revelation. I think when you look at all of those verses up top there concerning prophecy, that's the way prophecy is used in the New Testament. And I go into a lot more detail in the paper, which I think you have. But knowledge is the same way. Knowledge isn't talking about someone that has knowledge of the Bible. It's talking about someone that has extra biblical information given to them directly from God to relay it to the church. And I understand tongues and its interpretation as a revelatory gift as well, 
Because 1 Corinthians 14, verses 26 and 27, talks about when a tongue is in a church, it needs to be interpreted for the benefit of the listener. So I think there was a sense in which tongues um, was also being used to convey to the church direct revelation from God. So I see all three of these that 1 Corinthians 13 anticipates will pass away as revelatory gifts. So with that being said, just a little bit of background on 1 Corinthians. It seems to me that the dominant theme in 1 Corinthians is Paul is upset about disunity in the church. And all of the verses at the top there uh, show you where he's upset about disunity. So 1 Corinthians 12-14 through 14 fits into that because these, these various gifts that were in practice at that time, tongues, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge, were being used in a, dis, in a way to disunify the church there at Corinth. So Paul explains in chapter 12 that all of the gifts are from the same God for use in the same body. So don't use them uh, in a disharmonious way. Don't use them to pursue disunity within the church. And then down in chapter 14, he gives priority and order when these gifts were in use, exactly the rules that were to be followed when these gifts were practiced. And sandwiched right in the middle is the famous 1 Corinthians 13 passage, which our text is found, where there's an emphasis on love. In other words, use these gifts in a loving way, not in a disunifying way. So with that as our focus, you can take chapter 13 and you can divide it into three parts. You have the necessity of love, verses 1 through 3, the nature of love, verses 4 through 7, and then where we're going to be spending our time there, verses 8 through 13, which deals with the endurance of love. And what Paul explains in verses 8 through 13 is love is very interesting because it's going to stand the test of time. Uh, it's going to last much longer uh, than all of these gifts. So if you're going to pursue anything in your Christian life, it ought to be love rather than gifts being used in a disharmonious way because of love's endurance, verses 8 through 13. So let's take a look at our whole context here. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, that's our big controversial phrase, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, but when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So verses 8 through 10, um, unlike love, the revelatory gifts will cease. And then he gives two illustrations. When the revelatory gifts cease, what will happen? It will be a transition from immaturity to maturity, verse 11. And it will be a transition from limited sight to full sight, verse 12. But then he goes on and he says, really you ought to focus on, if anything, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Because the day in history will come when faith won't be necessary, because we will see Jesus as he is. And the day in history will come when hope will be unnecessary, because we will see Jesus as he is. So of those three, there's only one that's going to continue on, and that's love itself, 
And Paul brings all of this up because of his concern about disunity in the body of Christ, concerning the practice of these revelatory gifts, and how the Corinthians were misusing these. So the big question is, okay, if prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are going to cease when the perfect comes, the big question, of course, is what is meant by the word perfect? That's the battle. Uh, the adjective used for perfect is the, the teleos. And it's not the easiest question in the world to answer because there's at least three major views on it. View number one is the perfect is talking about something in the eschaton, yet future. Some eschatological event. You know, the second coming, the millennial kingdom, the rapture. And so these revelatory gifts continue until that eschatological event takes place. View number two is no, the perfect is when the church reaches a state of maturity. And once the church reaches that state of maturity, then the revelatory gifts cease. And view number three, which is the view I'm going to argue for, is no, this is speaking of the completed New Testament canon. Once the canon of the New Testament is completed, once John finished the very last verse in Revelation chapter 22, we had a completed canon and the revelatory gifts at that point, about A.D. 95, stopped. And view three, which is the view that I'm going to try to contend for, is a view that's really fallen on hard times. It's just dismissed outright by people. So here's Martin Lloyd-Jones um, commenting on view number three. And he said, indeed, there's only one word to describe such a view. It is nonsense. Well, why don't you just come out and tell us how you feel? Uh, don't beat around the bush. So whatever reason, view number three is almost, uh, it's looked at as, you know, it's... It's silly, don't even go there. There's no exegetical defense for it at all. Yet the more I've looked at this, and this is the product really of a paper that I wrote for the Chafer Theological Journal back in 2004, um, the more I've looked at that, I think the third view is the only one that makes sense. But let's sort of walk through these and see what we can do with it. The first view is the eschaton view. The perfect is something in the future. And by and large, and I've probably held all three of these views at different times in my Christian life. But it's clearly the most popular view. And it defines the perfect as something ideal, perfect, or unblemished. And, of course, the English translation perfect, without looking at the Greek, leads you to the conclusion that the perfect must mean like 100% perfection. So there's different positions on it. Some believe it happens at death. Some believe it's the rapture, the perfect. Some believe it's the second advent of Christ. Some believe it's the eternal state and the expression face-to-face. Uh, is used to argue that this is the eternal state because Revelation 22 and verse 4 indicates that we will see God face to face. And you have to pay attention to the now and the then uh, with each of these views. You'll notice the word now, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. So the now, according to the eschaton view, is the revelatory gifts continuing until the end, until some eschatological event happens. And the then, verse 12, is once that eschatological event happens, the revelatory gifts at that point will cease. So, despite the fact that it, that probably is the most popular view, let me give you some problems with it. Uh, number one, teleos never means perfection, but only maturity in Paul's writings. There's a big difference between being mature and being perfect. A mature person still makes mistakes, but a perfect person 
doesn't. Uh, also, teleos is never used ever of a single eschatological event. It's never used of the second advent. It's never used of the millennial kingdom. It's never used anywhere else of the rapture. It's never used of the eternal state. And here is a piece of the puzzle that gets overlooked by many, many people. Is perfection is a quality. And what it does is it pits quality against a quantitative idea. Quality and quantity, those two ideas, they don't coalesce together very well. Because remember what he says in verse 9 or verse 10, the perfect. And that's pitted against revelation in part. So if you turn teleos into perfection, you're taking a quality, qualitative idea, and you're pitting it against a quantitative idea, in part, and that really strains the analogy. Beyond that, eschatological events, when they happen, happen perfectly, and they happen instantaneously. I mean, that's how the kingdom is going to come. It's not going to be gradual. Uh, that's how the rapture is going to take place. That's how the eternal state will be ushered in. It will be an instantaneous event. And once it happens, it'll be an event of, of perfection. And to call the teleos that strains the analogy of verse 11, where Paul analogizes the teleos to himself. You see what he says in verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. Think like a child. Reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with foolish things. Now, Paul was a very mature person, but you can go and look at his life, and he wasn't perfect at all. He was maturing. But he certainly had never reached a place of sinless perfection. And Paul saw himself really as a work in progress. Um, so it wasn't some kind of instantaneous point in Paul's life where he arrived at perfection in terms of his daily walk. And so you start to see a problem with this eschaton view because it's not handling well the analogy of maturity that Paul uses there in verse 11. Beyond that, uh, teleos is a neuter adjective. And that's a very strange way, in my opinion, to describe the second coming of Christ. I would think teleos here would not be neuter if it's describing the second coming of Christ, but it would be masculine adjective to depict his personal coming. And probably the biggest problem from a practical level that I can think of with the eschaton view is if the eschaton view is correct, that means the revelatory gifts have been continuing on for the last 2,000 years, and God for the last 2,000 years has been revealing new truth to his church, and that to me is problematic because it takes the canon of Scripture and makes it wide open. If prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, revelatory gifts are continuing until something happens yet future, then you might as well take people's visions or whatever and entitle them Revelation 23 and add them to the back of your Bible. So the canon is uh, wide open at that point. And that's a problem because when the Bible anticipates a completed canon, it uses words like this in Jude 3, faith that was once and for all handed down to the saints. John in Revelation 22 verse 18 says, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And of all people, John MacArthur gets this one right. Um, this is one of the first times in a long time I've been able to quote John MacArthur favorably. Um, his book, Charismatic Chaos, is actually very good. And he, I got to give you the page numbers there, documents historically the major heresies that have come into Christianity, whether it's Mon Montanism, Roman Catholicism, Neo-Orthodoxy, Mormonism, he does a very good job 
documenting that all of these views can be traced to this idea that God is giving modern day revelations today. So I don't think, despite its popularity and despite the fact that I once held this view, I don't think that's the best view. View number two is the idea of the maturity of the church. So here's what basically what the view says. Uh, the view is a lot closer to the truth than view number one. And basically what it says is the completed canon. Now, you've got to watch that there's a little subtle difference. This view is not saying the perfect is the canon. It's saying what the perfect is is the maturity of the church. And the maturity of the church was brought into existence through the completed canon. Because the thinking is, once you have a completed canon, then the church can be unified. And once you have a completed canon, then the church is now independent of the partial revelatory gifts of the apostles. So the canon comes into existence, and it creates unity and independence within the church, and now the church reaches a state of maturity, and once it reaches a state of maturity, teleos, that's when these revelatory gifts of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, and the interpretation thereof ceased. So notice how this view handles the now-then language of verse 12. You know, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I see in part, but then known fully. They would handle that as the now is the revelatory gifts continuing until the church reached maturity, most likely at the end of the first century. The then language and what follows is the revelatory gifts ceasing uh, in the second century. So this particular view, uh, the maturity of the church view, has an awful lot going for it. Uh, for one thing, it's, it handles really well the analogy of verse 11, where Paul explains in verse 11 about you know infants and childhood and coming of age. And so understanding teleos' maturity would, would do great with verse um, 11. It would fit the overall context of 1 Corinthians as a whole, where Paul is exhorting the Corinthian church to maturity. That's when he says, I don't want you to be carnal or babes in Christ any longer, but I want you to grow up. Don't stay infants, don't stay carnal, but pursue spiritual adulthood. The teleos view you know, fits that theme uh, very, very well. And teleos also fits with Paul's use of the same word in the same book. Paul uses teleos for maturity in the same book. I've got the verses up there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. And the maturity, ver, uh, understanding teleos as maturity, fits really well with Paul, how Paul uses teleos everywhere else outside of 1 Corinthians. So you see there in parenthesis all the different verses where Paul is using teleos, and you'll notice that he is using it in terms of maturity. Uh, you would want to pay special attention to Ephesians 4, verse 13 where he says the gift of pastor-teacher is to bring the church to maturity. And on page, uh, what is it in my paper, 11 and 12, I've got a chart in there that gives you 18 similarities between the context of Ephesians 4 and the context of 1 Corinthians 13, where there's an emphasis on growth and there's an emphasis on maturity. So the church maturity view... I think is a lot closer to the truth than the first view, which is the eschaton view. Yet, in spite of its um, strengths, there are some weaknesses. The major weakness is the same problem with the eschaton view. Uh, it pits maturity, a quality, against 
in part, which is a quantity. So you've got this awkward strain between a qualitative idea, maturity, and a quantitative idea, revelations in part. So whatever you're doing with the perfect, uh, there in verse 10, it's got to fit somehow with the revelatory gifts in part. What those revelatory gifts were in part somehow was superseded. And you can't have a, a fair analogy unless you're comparing qual, uh, quantity with quantity. The first two views that I'm going over don't do that. They pit a quality with a quantitative idea, which makes those two views somewhat awkward, you know, in my opinion. And beyond that, you know, how do we determine if the church reaches uh, maturity? I mean, what they're saying is the canon came into existence, which gave the church um, a body of truth to rally, upon, rally around, so that created unity within the church, and it created independence from the apostolic revel revelatory gifts because now the church um, was no longer dependent. And so once you move from dependence to independence, you're moving into adulthood. And so that's how basically they're defining maturity. But the truth of the matter is those are very narrow criteria. When you actually look at what Paul says about maturity, he says a lot more than unity and independence. One of the things Paul is upset about as you go through 1 Corinthians is the divisions in the church. Now, are there divisions in your church? You guys are pretty quiet there. Um, there's divisions everywhere. And so I would ask myself, has the church ever reached maturity? If that's what Paul is upset about. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, is worried about Christians no longer being tossed to and fro, here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. I mean, is the church still succumbing to that? Well, of course it is. So to argue that the church is now mature really doesn't take into consideration everything that Paul talks about concerning a mature church. So what they've done is they've just picked a couple of criteria to define maturity, and they've almost ignored everything else that Paul emphasizes concerning um, maturity. And I would argue that the church even today, by Paul's standards, is not mature. And if you think the church today is mature, I would just challenge you to be a pastor for six months to a year, <laughs> and you'll probably have a different uh, perspective. Three to six days, Three to six days yeah. <laughs> so um, the eschaton view is problematic, as I've tried to demonstrate. The maturity view of the church is, I think, a lot closer to the truth but I think it's problematic as well. So what then is the, what I think is the correct answer? The teleon is the, not the maturity of the church, the teleon is the completed canon. That would be view number three. So what this view is saying is the first century revelatory gifts, knowledge, prophecy, and tongues, were given in part. And you see that right there in verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. I know in part, but then I will know fully. So what was happening pre in early Christianity before John penned the book of Revelation is God was sustaining the church through different revelatory gifts. But those were always intended by God to be gifts in part. They have now been superseded, according to the canon view, by a sufficient and complete canon of Scripture. So, do we have now a complete and sufficient canon of Scripture? Yes, we do. That's the perfect. The perfect supersedes the revelatory gifts in part. And we now have a document, 66 books of the Bible, which 
as is anticipated in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, has the ability to equip us for how many good works? Every good work. Now, if that's true, then the revelatory gifts, in part, are no longer necessary. We have in Scripture a completed canon containing God's promises which are sufficient to grant us, what's the word underlined there, the first one? Everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. We now have in the completed canon of Scripture the truth of God given to the saints, handed down once for all. And that is this fixed, finite body of writings that we have Old Testament, New Testament, where we dare not add anything to it. Because John says, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. So there's a lot of people out there saying, Lord, talk to me. Please talk to me. And God reaches down from heaven with a Bible. And God says, I've spoken here. So this is the mindset of the, of the canon view. Which means, and there's an interesting juxtaposition when you look at all of these verses together, between prophecy, tongues, and knowledge, and speaking and thinking and reasoning like a child. What was prophecy, tongues, and knowledge? According to the canon view, it was the same thing as speaking, thinking, and reasoning like a child. Because those revelatory gifts were always intended to be partial. Now you have the completed perfect, um, the teleon, making those revelatory gifts in part no longer necessary. So let me quote a great theologian here. Uh, Robert Dean says, the child represents the incomplete knowledge available to the infant pre-canon church. Now, Kenneth Gentry, here's a guy that I spent my whole life disagreeing with uh, on all kinds of issues, but he's got it right here on this canon view. He says, similarly, when the church was in her infancy, she operated by means of bit-by-bit piecemeal revelation. But when she grew older, she operated by means of a finalized scripture. That's a wonderful articulation of the canon view. So how does the canon view understand the now and then language? The now is the revelatory gifts continuing throughout the apostolic age in the pre-New Testament canon era. So those gifts continued on because the church needed them at that time The then language describes those revelatory gifts ceasing in the post-apostolic and post-New Testament canon era. Now, when you try to really do good work in exegesis or theology, you know, it's not enough to just state your view and why the other views you think are incorrect. You have to you have to be intellectually open and acknowledge the fact that there's a reason this has been, is very controversial. I mean, there must be something wrong with my view for, this, for it to be this controversial. And I'm here trying to be intellectually honest and acknowledge that there are some holes um, in this position. I think I can answer them. But I hold to a view like this, not because it's the perfect view, pardon the pun, but I think it has a lot fewer problems than the other views. So, what are some problems with this view? Well, let's talk about the strengths first before we talk about the problems. The, one of the reasons I really like the canon view is it is a suitable antithesis to in part. The other views are pitting quality against quantity. The canon view doesn't do that because it's pitting quantity against quanti- quantity Partial revelation versus full revelation. Um, Myron Houghton, who Paul Scharf studied under, is very good on this. 
He says, is it possible to determine the nature of the partial gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge? Yes. The answer is that they are revelational in quality. Since this is so, the perfect must be revelational. That's what he's getting at. You, whatever you're doing with in part, you've got to do with the perfect. Um, he goes on and he says, that, uh, excuse me, this is someone else, Charles Smith. He says, that which is complete should logically be made the same kind as that which is partial. And is therefore most naturally understood as a reference to the completion of, of revelation for the church age. So I really like the canon view. That's my primary reason why I like it. Because it allows me to keep the analogy pure and unstrained between quantity and quantity, and it doesn't put me in this awkward position where I have to juxtapose quality with quantity. The second reason I really like the canon view is teleos is actually used of the scripture in the Bible. In the very first book of the New Testament, which would be which book? The book of James. James, we believe, is our first New Testament book. And right there in James 1... 25, you'll see that the perfect teleos is used of God's law. So perfect can be used of Scripture. So I like it on that basis. I also like it because the canon view handles well the mere analogy of verse 12, since the Scripture furnishes us with an honest assessment about ourselves. Is that not true? Paul says, for we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. You'll notice that in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, the very first New Testament epistle, you'll notice that God's word is called a mirror. And if Paul is writing this with the knowledge of James, which I think he would be, because James is the first New Testament book, um, you actually have precedent that the Word of God can not only be the teleos, but it can also function as a mirror. Robert Dean says, Only God has a complete knowledge of the believer, and only with a completed canon can the believer have sufficient objective knowledge of himself. Prior to the completed canon, the believer could only have an incomplete understanding of who he is and what he possesses as a royal, uh, as a member of the royal family of God and all of the vast assets that God has provided for him. So you can look into the scripture and you can see God's standard, and it's the scripture never lies to us. Just like the mirror never lies. I mean, we might want the mirror to lie, <laughs> but the mirror tells you the truth. Um, hey, Andy, you're getting a few gray hairs, you know. Hey, Andy, you're about 20 to 30 pounds overweight, and, you know, which actually is a conservative estimate, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, if I, if I ask my wife or someone, well, my wife would tell me the truth, but if I ask somebody that doesn't want to hurt my feelings those questions, I mean, they're going to kind of beat around the bush. The mirror doesn't do that. It tells you the truth. So you look, you look into the standard of the scripture, and we see ourselves in the middle tense of our salvation, and we say, well, I've got some growing to do. Because the, the canon of Scripture functions like that mirror. And so the canon view handles, I think, really well the mirror analogy. I found this in Keener's background commentary. This is very helpful, what Craig Keener has produced here. Because in all of the passages of the New Testament, he gives you the background uh, of, of what was happening in Corinth. And he writes, Corinth was famous as a producer of some of the finest bronze mirrors in antiquity. But even the best mirrors reflected images imper Im imperfectly. So he, he's anticipating a perfect mirror that will come along and, and reflect what we need in perfection, 
to give us an honest assessment of ourselves. Um, Myron Houghton writes that that self-assessment was not possible before the completion of the canon. Now here's something a little tricky. Uh, the canon view, in my opinion, handles well the immediate now of verse 12, which is the word, I think you pronounce it, uh, RT, and the distant now of verse 13, which is the word um, nuni. So remember Paul gave two illustrations. Uh, he basically said, when the perfect comes, we will move from immaturity to maturity, from limited sight to full sight, and then he said you ought to focus on love because love is going to supersede the phasing out of the revelatory gifts. And actually of, love, of faith, hope, and love, you ought to focus on love because faith won't be needed one day because we'll see Jesus as he is. And hope won't be needed because we'll see Jesus as he is. But love will never disappear. So of, every, of anything, Paul says, focus on love. So... As this analogy is being developed, as you look at verse 12, it says, for now, and that's RT, we see dimly, but then face to face. For now, and that's RT, I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. And then in verse 13, he talks about faith, hope, and love continuing, and he switches words, and now he uses nuni. And what's interesting is the canon view handles really well the switch in Greek through that word translated now, because here's language from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, and basically to summarize, it says when arti and nuni are used together, Arti has a more um, immediate sense. And that would fit really well the canon view, which is arguing that the revelatory gifts are going to cease really quick. But now, faith, hope, and love, those will continue all the way through the inner Advent age uh, until we see Jesus and faith is no longer necessary, and hope is no longer necessary. So the canon view actually handles really well when these two, RT and Nuni, are used simultaneously. RT has more of an imminent sense, and Nuni has more the idea of something that continues throughout the inner Advent age. So with all of that being said, what are some problems with the canon view? And there are problems. The first problem is face-to-face. -face. I mean, how, how can um, a completed canon be equated with seeing God face-to-face? -face? Well, look at the language very carefully. It never says we see God face-to-face. -face. God has to be read into the passage. And face-to-face -face can refer to what comes from God to us rather than us being with God. See, everybody, when they see that language face-to-face, -face, they think it's talking about us being with God one day. And actually track the face-to-face -face language through the Bible, and you'll see it typically refers to information coming from God to us and not us being with God. So that's how it's used in Judges 6, verse 22, face-to-face, -face, information coming from God. That's how it's used, now here it says mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, but that's how the concept is used in Numbers 12, verses 6 through 8. And so when it says in verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face-to-face, -face, you shouldn't read into that, I'm going to see God face-to-face, because -face, that's not what the text says. What it's talking about is information coming from God to us, and that fits very well this canon perspective that I'm trying to, trying to share. The second 
major problem with the canon view is this expression, knowing as known. So when the perfect comes, it, t it almost looks like we're going to know fully. And this is what caused Martin Lloyd-Jones to outright reject the view. Notice what he says. I gave you this quote earlier, or part of it. Referring to the completed canon view, um, Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, quote, it means that you and I, who have the scripture open before us, know much more than the Apostle Paul of God's truth. It means that we are altogether superior even to the apostles themselves, including the Apostle Paul, exclamation point. It means that we are now in a position which we know even as we are known by God. Indeed, there is only one word to describe such a view. It is nonsense. So he doesn't think our view, or my view, I should say, handles well the idea that when the perfect comes, we'll know in full. But notice uh, what Myron Houghton says by way of response. However, the problem does not go away if the words are interpreted eschatologically, knowing fully, in other words. In eternity, will believers really know fully, just as they have been fully known? I mean, are we going to be omniscient in eternity? I don't think so. We'll see things a lot better, but I don't think we're going to be omniscient. He says the answer to this question seems to be yes, but only in some limited qualified sense. If that answer is acceptable for the eschatological interpretation, then it ought to be acceptable for this writer's completed canon views as well. What's interesting, though, is when Jesus describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit coming through illumination. He uses language like when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. He does that in verse 13. He does that in verse 15. When Paul the Apostle is describing the ministry of illumination, he says the Spirit searches all things, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. So that, verse uh, 15, 12, I think it is, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. I mean, I'm not claiming that because we have a completed canon, we're somehow omniscient. Because we never become omniscient. But when you look at the biblical descriptors of what we have, it uses this expression, all things, all truth, over and over again. And the canon view harmonizes with these descriptors. This is how I'm trying to answer um, Martin Lloyd-Jones. But he who is spiritual, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 15, he who is spiritual appraises all things. So, so this is how God describes the information that we now have via a completed canon. We're no longer dealing piecemeal with things. You have a suffic sufficient body of truth, which enables us to become all things, everything God wants us to be in all things related to faith and practice. And so I don't think this idea that when the canon comes, we're going to know fully is as much a problem as Martin Lloyd-Jones is turning this uh, into. A third objection to the canon view is that the completed canon view is something that Paul would have never thought of. Paul wasn't thinking about a completed canon. Uh, the furthest thing from Paul's thoughts was a completed canon. And I, I do think Paul, although he died in AD 67, roughly, I think he had in mind a completed canon that was coming. First of all, he was a rabbi, right? So he understood a completed canon in the Old Testament sense of the word. And then when you track his writings, he talks about guard the deposit, 1 Timothy 1.12, 1 Timothy 1.14, guard the entrustment, 1 Timothy 6 verse 20. Uh, when he's in prison, he asks, um, when you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas, with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. 
you know, when you look at the things Paul valued in terms of a finite body of writings, I think the completed canon idea, although it was yet future from him, was something that he was thinking about. And then the fourth uh, objection to the canon view is people say, well, if, you're, if the canon view is correct, then 1 Corinthians 14 is not for us. You know, where it mentions all of the rules for knowledge and tongues and prophecy in the body of Christ. Paul goes into great detail on that in 1 Corinthians 14. And people just can't get around the fact that that chapter is not for us. As if I have to see myself in every single passage, right? That's not exegesis, that's narcissus, isn't it? I mean, I have to be the center of every passage. Because, I mean, we all understand as dis dispensationalists that all Scripture is for us, but not all Scripture is what? About us. I mean, have you read the book of Leviticus lately? I mean, is that directly speaking to us and what we ought to be doing? Well, I don't see any unblemished lambs in here. And yet, you can read Leviticus and, and learn great truths about God. That's how I think 1 Corinthians 14 should be approached. There's tremendous truths about God and priority and order. Uh, and just because you say knowledge, prophecy, and tongues is not for today means we just tear 1 Corinthians 14 you know, out of our out of our Bible. Because all scripture is God-breathed and what? And profitable. I don't have to be the subject of everything for it to be profitable. Let me just wrap up here by giving you five very fast problems with cessationism in general. Um, a lot of people will say, well, if the canon view is correct and there are no prophets for today, then how do you explain Joel 2, which predicts future prophets? How do you explain Revelation 11, which predicts future prophets? And the answer to that is Joel 2 and Revelation 11 concern God's program for Israel. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about God's program for the church. A second argument against cessationism in general is if you take away prophecy and knowledge, suddenly you're leaving the church with no ability to proclaim and understand scripture, they say. But that's not true because we have the edificatory gifts remaining, like teaching, like the gift of pastor-teacher. A third major objection is that cessationists are anti supernaturalists. Oh, you don't believe in miracles. Well, if I didn't believe in miracles, why would I pray? Why would I pray for people to get well if I, if I didn't believe in miracles? Just because you're a cessationist doesn't mean you don't believe God miraculously moves his hand in history. I, th I personally think it's rarer than it was in apostolic times, but it clearly happens. I mean, we, haven't we had multiple testimonies here? earlier today about the providential care in the Ukraine, um, that's, that's not being an anti-supernaturalist at all, believing in that. Yeah, but does God heal today? Well, of course he does, when he wants to. But he heals directly when he does, not indirectly through someone claiming one of the sign gifts uh, the gift of healing. Uh, number four here, and I'm almost finished, is you've heard this one. You're putting God in a box. Have you heard that? Your views are putting God in a box. Well, here's the deal. God only operates based on parameters that he himself has ordained. So if I were to say, hey, you're saved by good works, and you come back and say, no, the Bible says you're only saved by faith through grace. Well, you're putting God in a box. You just put God in a box. No, no one put God in a box. You're arguing the doctrine of salvation based on the principles that God himself established in his word. See that? And then there's the church history argument. Uh, people go into all of these church fathers and they produce all of these examples you know, where miracles and things like this were happening in church history. And that argument is non-persuasive because as you look at this slide here and look up every reference, 
This is every reference I could find in the Bible where a miracle is happening and God has nothing to do with it. Right down to uh, Pharaoh's magicians imitating to a point what Moses and Aaron were able to do. That was a real miracle, but obviously God wasn't involved in it. That list there will tell you everywhere a miracle happens in the Bible and God has nothing to do with it. So just because a miracle is happening in church history proves nothing because Satan performs counterfeit signs and wonders. And producing all of these miracles in church history, you know, it's interesting. I can show you language from Chrysostom, Augustine, and Philip Schaff, a reputable historian, showing you that the glossolalia, the tongues, ceased at a certain point. So you quote your church history sources, and I'll quote my church history sources. It doesn't prove anything at the end of the day. So the bottom line, and I hope you read the paper because there's a lot more detail in there, but the bottom line is there's three basic positions on this perfect, the eschaton view, the maturity of the church view, and the completion of the canon view. I'm of the perspective that view number three uh, uh, is the view with the least problems. And um, I just wish people, when they analyze this, would take view number three more seriously. That's, that's my point, so I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> At the risk of so sounding self-aggrandizing, you did a great job and brought a lot of points that I didn't bring out in my article, and that was very helpful for yeah. me, too. I want to tell, talk about a couple of things. In 1990, Bruce Bumgardner, or in the early 90s, 91, 92, 93, somewhere near, Bruce isn't here to, get, to keep me accurate, but he had a professor by the name of Lanier Burns, who was the head of the theology department at Dallas Seminary. And when he was a young professor, he was very good and exegetically grounded. He morphed in the 80s, like several other faculty members did uh, at Dallas when they went off to liberal schools. But he made the comment in Bruce's class, they were supposed to write a position paper on tongues and he said, but I don't want anybody taking the view that the perfect is the canon because nobody holds that view anymore. <laughs> Since that time, there had been uh, How Myron Houghton's paper mm -hmm. was in 96. Mm -hmm. Ken Gentry. Who? Uh, Kenneth Gentry. Kenneth Gentry. Uh, I wrote an article and Andy wrote an article. Those are four scholarly articles that have been written defending the, the perfect as the canon view, and there may be one or two more or some in some books that I'm unfamiliar with now. Yeah. But that just shows you where some, that, that the uh, concept of scholarly in certain circles is not what it was defined as in the early years of Dallas. In the early years of Dallas, someone was scholarly if they knew the Bible, if they knew the text, and they could accurately explain and defend the meaning of the text. Now it is, if you know everything that everybody has ever written about that particular topic and not come to a definite conclusion, then you are scholarly. <laughs> there are five views on Genesis 1-1. One, one. <laughs> One, two, three, four, and five. You may take your choice. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. So true. You heard Lewis Berry Chafer speak to us from the grave yesterday. He didn't act that way, did he? So there you go. So anybody have any, any questions? The other one should be up there. Where, where's the other? Um, here's one here. Oh, that's got a cord. Here it is down here. It's hiding from us. <laughs>
A, a superfluous question. Um, would you consider the working? Just look it on. Turn it on. Yeah. Test, test, test. I just got to be like a rapper. Um, uh, what about, like, in that particular passage, only three um, evidentiary works are being examined. Um, but, in, uh, but in 1 Corinthians 12, there are other ones that are not mentioned in part, working of miracles, mm -hmm. healings. Yeah. So how would you go about explaining the, the perfect, uh, the, those ceasing in light of they're not being mentioned in 13. Yeah. Well, I, if I was arguing that those ceased, I wouldn't use 1 Corinthians 13 because it's revelation in part versus revelation in full. I would go elsewhere in Corinthians, like it talks about the sign. I think it's in 2 Corinthians, the signs of an apostle. So those signs are connected to the apostles. And as the apostles ceased, those disappeared also. I'd have to go somewhere else for that. On the other hand, I am. This is a weak mic. On the other hand, or you need an interpreter words of wisdom question. and words of knowledge would be revelatory, and I would classify them as in the same category as knowledge and, and prophecy. Guys back Dr. There. Woods? Yeah. Over here. Yes. Um, as you were talking about face-to-face, -face, I'm, I'm afraid I got distracted a little bit with the Greek. Um, the, that phrase, at least in my, my cursory search, seems to only come up one time in the, the Septuagint in Genesis 32, 30. Did you look at that and the fact that the, the same identical words in the same order are used only in, in 1 Corinthians 13 and then in Genesis 32 where mm -hmm. Jacob wrestles with God and was mm -hmm. face to face? Yeah. No, I didn't know it was the same order in words, but I, I acknowledge that face to face can mean seeing God. But there's other places where it doesn't mean that. It, it means not being with God, but information coming from God to us. And I think the latter works better because when it says, it doesn't say God in 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> So seeing God, and I did this for years because I held to the eschaton view. I was completely reading it into the passage based on Revelation 22. So that was my only point there. But I didn't know they were the same words, but that would be my response. Yeah, thank you. Just an observation. Um, the way you've argued this, it really doesn't seem as much of a slam dunk passage to just throw on the topic uh, for cessationism the, to, to get into the nuance of why we hold this view. It's not the strongest, clearest statement like Acts 1631 or something yeah. uh, that you can throw on this. Yeah. I think that you've demonstrated that today. Yeah, I mean, there's a, when something is really controversial, you can't just come at it as there's one way of looking at it, my way or the highway. You have to be open to the potential uh, criticisms. Dr. Woods? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, Brad. Hey. Um, so I've been dealing with this issue with quite a handful of folks. I had a friend who went to Regent, and I think he might have studied under Fee or someone like that. But it was interesting because I always regarded the perfect as being the completed canon, and he never gave me any reason to doubt it, but it was funny because he didn't really want to talk about it, suggesting that someone had written a paper that put that idea to rest, that our idea to rest. Do you know, and I've been looking for it, I've asked him for it multiple times, I said, I'd just love to read it. Do you know what the, kind of the authoritative work from the other side would be? Um, you know, I don't know if there is some authoritative work putting to rest the canon view, other than people just maligning it over the, all of the time. It's like a lot of us are afraid just in the culture to express views. And the way they get us to not express views is they just make fun of the person that holds it. Um, so that's why I brought up Martin Lloyd-Jones, who obviously is someone we all respect, you know, as, but he was reformed as the day is long, you know. But he just says it's nonsense. He doesn't even interact with the view, it's just nonsense. And that's kind of what uh, you're talking about with Lanier Burns. Yeah. Just, you know, just nonsense. 
when I when I because for a while I was because I was bought into what Dallas was saying, I took it. I, I took the the same uh, you know eschaton view until the early 90s and after i worked my way through everything or i guess it was the late 80s when i was working with the vineyard stuff and everything and i worked my way through all the exegesis and everything came to my position and i sat down and i walked george meisinger through it and george says well that's merrill unger's position yeah, unger, yeah. and that's what it is it's the same position merrill unger took yeah andy might not have looked into this but i'm always curious about how the calvary chapels handle this because they're you know so, so strong mm -hmm. on expository teaching as one of their teachers and professors told me one time and pastors we are the bible teaching church in america right now mm -hmm. <laughs> which i kind of laughed they said no we are you know but yeah. uh how do they handle this because i know they really play down yeah. the tongues yeah but have you looked into which of these yeah. views they hold yeah, I used to, I attended a Calvary Chapel, um, the the big one, Costa Mesa, Sunday night, and so I, I was very curious how they handled it. You know, they're they're very good with their dispensationalism, premillennialism, pre-rapture. They're very verse by verse teaching, but they do hold to this uh, belief, and it I would call it a soft, charismatic belief. And they have these services called Afterglow. And I went, I went and watched, and they were, they're, very, they're very good at 1 Corinthians 14. They, they apply the rules. And so I'm, I'm much more comfortable with them, you know, of all the charismatic. What's that? Yeah, the perfect is something in the future. Um, but there are, see, this, and this was part of the split between Chuck Smith and John Wimber over this kind of issue. Uh, John Wimber wanted to just do all the supernatural stuff. And Chuck Smith's quoting Mark 16 would say, let's teach the word and the signs and wonders will follow the teaching of the word. So Chuck's view was more, as best I understood it, a softer charismatic view that was never done in the main service. And it was done something afterwards that a smaller group of people attended. And when I sat in on those sessions, they were very rigorous about the rules being followed. And I can guarantee you that was not happening in the vineyard. It was the exact opposite. It was like Katie bar the door. And so that led to the split there between vineyard and Calvary Chapel over this kind of issue. Okay, Wayne's gonna be our last question. And, and we have to show equal opportunity to those who have some heretical view. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, I thought that was an excellent presentation. I've worked on this passage a long time. Uh, I find it interesting Paul has these contrasts. You know, you have the complete and the incomplete. And you have that which is dim and that which is very clear. I know when you look at every single example, and I've looked at every one, uh, in the Bible on face-to-face -face that Paul could have had, rela you know, relating to, it refers to that which is ambiguous, difficult, or dim, over against which is very clear and perspicuous. In other words, there's no question. So once you do away with the idea that you don't have a second coming in this passage, <laughs> the face-to-face -face only makes sense. In other words, now we see dimly, like the ancient mirrors, yeah. but then we'll see clearly, unambiguously, what is true. And I think that's what Paul's getting at in the mm -hmm. passage, and I think you did a good job. Okay. Praise God. Yeah, the, the, I don't know. I, I, may have, I may have blanked out when, uh, when you said it. But in the Septuagint version of the Numbers passage, mm -hmm. where it says that, uh, not with him. Um, There's says, a Judges passage too. Yeah, but it's in the Numbers passage. Okay. The Numbers passage, um, uh, I, somewhere in there where it talks about, not in dark sayings, that's the same Greek word that's used in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. It's, it's enigmatically. Okay. You know, it's enigma in the Greek, yeah. in the Septuagint there, and in First Corinthians. So there's clearly picking up, uh, you know, that kind of a background. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you.